Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my quest for historical knowledge here on the internet. Okay, um, today I am watching a video um, from a channel I have not seen before. Um, the channel is called History Matters, and I was going through their videos and uh, saw some of their stuff, and this was one of their more popular videos, and this is, uh, they call it, uh, I guess the series 10 Minute History um, this one is the early British Empire, and I saw they have a um, another one afterwards. And if you guys kind of like this, then maybe we'll look into doing the the, the second video. All right, this video was uh, picked actually by the patrons um, in the weekly patrons pick poll. So I put this up after seeing this video, and the patrons wanted to see it. So this just narrowly won out against some of the other videos that it was up against. Um, if you would like to be a part of um, the weekly poll. Uh, all you got to do is become a patron. Um, donators of all financial levels right now are able to participate in the poll starting at the moment at a dollar um, a month. Uh, and this supports the channel as well. And again, it gets you a little more influence on the content that comes over the video. So if you'd like to do that, um, there is a link to the Patreon uh, down below in the description. And you can check that out. Um, all right, if you like the original video too, the link will be down in the description. You can check that out and give them a like and subscribe as well. Okay, let's go ahead and check it out. So 10 minute history, the early British empire. So just from the first slide, 1497. So it really looks like they're kind of beginning with the sort of age of exploration um, that has just started uh, within the recent decades. 1497 and the British empire didn't exist. Neither did Britain. Right. England was the largest and most powerful country in the British Isles at this time. Wales, the Isle of Man and a piece of Ireland called the Pale were firmly under English control. The rest of Ireland was mostly independent, only giving lip service to the English monarchy and in the north, Scotland remained independent and a close ally of France. King Henry VII of England wished to improve England's trading situation. The English were not exactly renowned sailors at this point, and so Henry did what everyone else did at the time, hired an Italian, a certain Giovanni Cabotto. <laughs> Cabotto was searching for a northern route to China, but landed in North America, becoming the first European to set foot there, at least since the Vikings had 500 years earlier. Henry VII continued the long tradition of English monarchs and died, before being succeeded by his son Henry VIII. Henry VIII contributed to the expansion of English... You know, a lot of people don't talk about, especially with North America... Um, what, who were kind of the first people to be in like North America? We know in Columbus's, um, original journeys and things like that, he was, uh, more in the Caribbean era. And then usually people start talking right away then about, um, kind of the further conquistadors, right? So you got like, uh, Hernan Cortez is going to go down to what's today, Mexico, um, Francisco Pizarro in, in, um, down in, in uh, South America with the, where the Inca empire was around Peru, um, and then you hear, you know, just usually just kind of littered in some of the other people that did end up going up north. Like you might hear about Lafayette from France or um, Henry Hudson or um, the whole Jamestown colony. But the whole um, this one about this guy, I don't know if I know about this. Let me look at it again real quick. Northern route to China, but landed in North America, a certain Giovanni Cabotto. Cabotto was searching for a northern route to China, but landed in North America, becoming... Okay, so yeah, they, you know, once the, you know, Columbus returns, and they find out, you know, he hadn't, you know, eventually, it took a long time, obviously, to figure this out, but that this was not a direct route to, uh, to Asia, um, the way that Columbus had traveled, more kind of uh, southerly, they... We're trying to find about every way possible. Um, so, yeah, some of these more of the, 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 the northern um, European countries, they were looking for a passage potentially north. Basically, they want what they want to see is, is there a northern passage to Asia? Because they have no idea. This is 1497. They have no idea how large this land mass is. They have no idea. And they basically end up exhausting about every single way possible in the, in the whole um, age of exploration. They go up north, find out, oh, that doesn't work. Canada's there. <laughs> And there's ice, and it's extremely hard to travel. So then they, you know, they want to think, can you go through, right? Can you go through? And you see some attempts. I mean, uh, um, uh, I think it was a Balboa that um, went and was um, trying to go ahead and cross, kind of try to find somewhere in the middle here in the in the in the Americas to cross and um, 
Those doesn't doesn't really work. I mean, you can yeah. I mean, there's not a direct passageway. You're gonna have to cross land. You know what I mean? Um, so you'll see that, and then you're gonna see uh, attempts potentially of south, which is not an efficient way. I mean, yeah, technically Magellan does it, um, goes around the south, but that doesn't work out. And then France um, uh, with Lafayette, they they go up the the Saint Lawrence River and try to, and they end up kind of going Saint Lawrence River and getting close to kind of around the great lakes region um so anyway but yeah it's kind of interesting how you see all these different attempts at trying to get to asia um because it was such a potentially profitable thing i mean the first european to set foot there at least since the vikings had 500 years earlier, i don't really know about this one though continued the long tradition of english monarchs and died before being succeeded by his son henry the eighth famous henry guy VIII right contributed to the expansion of english holdings by incorporating wait he did things other than execute his wives or whatever and, and divorce them and stuff. Wow. Breaking Wales into the Kingdom of England and giving it representation in Parliament. In 1534, Henry split with Rome, creating the Church of England, which would begin the religious divide between England and Ireland. Eight years later, he had himself declared the King of Ireland, although in reality, this didn't change very much. Henry mm -hmm. was succeeded by Edward, and shortly after that came Queen Mary I, a Catholic. Bloody Mary. Philippe II of Spain. One important part of Mary's rule was the beginning of the Irish plantations, which saw lands belonging to Irish laws confiscated and given to the English for settlement. Mary and Philippe never had children, and so after Mary's death in 1558, the crown passed to her sister Elizabeth because the English Parliament made sure Philippe was ineligible. Elizabeth was a devout Protestant and reinstated many of her father's laws which punished Catholics, much to the anger of Philippe who saw himself as the defender of Catholicism. Spain held the Netherlands at this point and the northern part, which had a large Protestant population, was rebelling against Spanish rule. England was the the Catholic split um, totally changed England's England's history, both internally and externally. And amazing when you you kind of rewind it back, and and uh, a lot of people put that origination point at the whole idea of Henry wanting um, um, to basically divorce his wife uh, because there was no. Um, uh, male heir coming out of that and then you know ask the pope for for an annulment of the marriage pope declines because um, that's again uh, against um, cloth or catholic doctrine and then goes into basically breaking apart from the church passing act of supremacy he's going to be the leader of religion in in england thus taken away uh, went away from the pope which thus creates you know the anglican church and um Really, it, it, it seems like what they're kind of getting at here is that it really sets England on a almost like a new path from this point on of this kind of Protestant path. Now, you do see some of the times where they revert back, like uh, Mary, um, when she came into power, she wanted to, uh, in a way, kind of revert um, a lot of a lot of uh, UK here um, back to sort of Catholicism, and then that becomes after her um becomes it becomes more of a compromise between between the both both sides in england but it seems almost like yeah they're trying to make that point that once that uh kind of break sort of happened from the catholic church that england is kind of going to be a little bit more autonomous and kind of go maybe some different directions that they choose that's the kind of feeling i'm getting right now more than happy to help undermine spain's power and one way the english helped the dutch was by giving dutch privateers shelter in english ports so privateers were essentially pirates who had the protection of a government, and Elizabeth employed many. Spain had a yeah. growing collection. Yeah, they had a ton. Uh, most famous one you may have heard of is uh, Sir Francis Drake, who's known as the Queen's Pirate, maybe one of the most, maybe the most successful pirate in history. But yeah, privateers. It's like it's a pirate, but that works for the government. So you might be like, what? You know, but that was how they would sort of compete with the other nations is they would prey on the uh, treasure ships. Especially now, it's the mid 1500s when. Um, it's basically a race for colonization across the planet here by these European powers, and that was a thing. And then once once countries um, mutually started to to like the, the monarchies and governments um, to stop this state sponsored piracy or the privateering here, um, that's when you got a lot of these privateers who no longer had necessarily had the support of a monarchy or something. They start doing it for themselves, right? Doing their own pirating. And that's often what the, the pirates that you think of um, were was probably after that split or that breakup of the privateering sort of ending. But, of course, piracy is a very profitable thing. So once they lost their sponsors, they're like, we'll just do it ourselves. And that's what a lot of people did. 
colonial empire at this point, and there was a lot of trade, particularly in silver, between Spain and its colonies. Privateers would seize this cargo by raiding Spanish ports and ships before taking it back to England. <laughs> the most famous of England's privateers is Sir Francis Drake, who made right. numerous highly profitable raids against the Spanish. He also circumnavigated the globe and even claimed land in what is now California. First Englishman to he circumnavigate the globe. He also sent explorers to the New World, such as Sir Walter Raleigh, who set up a soon-to-be mysteriously abandoned colony at Roanoke Island in the North Roanoke. America. Elizabeth also continued diary. Yeah, the Roanoke's a weird story if you haven't heard of that. So it's one of the like the first English group there. And um uh and and they when when like travelers um came back or like new groups of people came back, uh they found out those people had abandoned the place and um don't really know kind of what happened to him. It was kind of kind of this eerie thing. And it wasn't until Jamestown. I mean, I'm sure they'll get to Jamestown here, but um, Jamestown being like the first successful of the English colonies there. I'm um, talking right first decade of the 1700s. Plantations to shore up the English position there. Exploration and colonization at this time was almost always reliant on royal patronage in order to get funded. English Spanish relations were not improved by England's moves across the Atlantic since Spain claimed nearly all of the New World and also losing silver was presumably not much fun for Philippe either. Relations worsened when Portugal, England's oldest ally, had a succession crisis which saw Philippe crowned its king. The final straw for Philippe was when Elizabeth had Mary, the Queen of Scots, beheaded in 1587. The reasons for this are complex, but it was essentially because Elizabeth did not want Scotland returning to Catholicism. So Philippe, now pretty fed up, ordered the creation of an armada which was to sail to the Netherlands before invading England. When the armada reached England, several skirmishes occurred, the most famous being the Battle of the Gravelines, where an English victory forced the Spanish fleet to sail around the British Isles in order to return to Spain. <laughs> Storms, a lack of food and disease killed thousands on the return journey, and this failure pretty much bankrupted Spain. The next year, England chose to counterattack and launch the English Armada under the command of Sir Francis Drake. The goals of the Armada were to destroy the remaining Spanish ships, stir revolt in Portugal and intercept any Spanish silver. So the English Armada was a complete failure and cost the lives of thousands of English sailors and was very expensive. It did, however, guarantee that England would remain independent. Towards the end of her reign, Elizabeth made one last contribution to the empire and founded the East India Company, which was given a monopoly on trade with India. The East India Company, I'm, I'm sure they'll go into it more, is it's an interesting thing where you're mixing private enterprise with like government support. Um, and this was one of the most important sort of companies that has ever existed because it basically it, it col they colonized. Um, and, uh, and it also operated with a huge government support. And it also monopolized things. It had its own military force and was had permission to use of it. Uh, I like to I make this this comparison. I don't know if it's a great one necessarily, but this giant company with an army. I was like, to get my students to think about it, I'd go, okay, here's what I want you to think about the East India Company. I want you to think of Walmart had an army. And all of a sudden kids are like, whoa, that would be a powerful thing, right? Um, if they could influence, you know, uh, their economic you know, pursuits basis on like a giant with a lot of wealth. Oh, and then the government totally gave them like the thumbs up and, and let them operate that way. And then they're like, Oh cow. Um, you know, Holy cow. That's, that's, that's like, that could be a powerful thing. So, uh, something to think about. Elizabeth died childless in 1603 and was succeeded by James VI of Scotland, who was crowned James I of England. James's early reign saw the end of the war with Spain and was marked by several attempts to kill him, most notably the gunpowder plot. James contributed to the empire by sponsoring colonial ventures. He sponsored another wave of plantations in Ireland, most notably the Ulster Plantation, which contained many Scottish settlers alongside English ones. James also oversaw the first permanent English settlement in the Americas the colony at Jamestown. Jamestown. Next was Bermuda, followed by Plymouth, which was famously founded by the Puritans who arrived from the Mayflower. So, Jamestown was founded by the Virginia Company of London with the goal of making its shareholders a profit. Yeah, well, you see, you see with these settlements, they all had different purposes. Virginia, the original founding... Um, or community and original communities there, successful communities of England, very monetary based, right? It was about investments and 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 that sort of thing. They all, they also didn't figure they didn't find the the um the stuff that they were wanting. They I mean these one reason why some of these old, uh, these early English colonies failed is these people came in hoping you know totally focusing on with their supplies and everything of going in and just getting rich quick off gold and all this stuff. Find out a lot of that happens and found out they were totally inept to actually surviving and setting up there which led to 
you know, starvation and all this stuff like Jamestown had, um, huge problem with that. And like, they were not surviving hardly and they only barely, um, end up, um, surviving in the end. And you can, you know, um, I know that story with, with, uh, getting help from the Powhatan Confederacy with, um, uh, Pocahontas and that sort of thing. That's kind of where that story derives from. But then you got up North, like the Puritans where people were, uh, kind of fleeing you know what they saw was religious persecution so you saw these different different groups kind of come into the americas early on here for different reasons the colony was famously led by john smith who maintained good relations with the native americans smith was forced to return to england after being injured in a gunpowder explosion and for a time relations between the english and the natives remained peaceful these good relations wouldn't last and soon the english and natives were fighting and after several wars the english managed to push the natives out of the area in order to grow the cash crops on which the colony relied indentured servants were imported a few things do not Go to the Disney movie Pocahontas for any type of accurate history there. The relationship between Pocahontas and John Smith was nothing like it was in the video. There was no romantic involvement and all that stuff that that or anything even close to that. That didn't happen. Uh, Pocahontas would have been a very young girl um, when John Smith was, was older. Um, the person she actually ends up marrying is named uh, uh, Rolf, um, who they do get married. And Pocahontas actually... Uh, was one of the first Native Americans to ever go to England. Um, they went, he went back, uh, she went back with him. And she actually ended up dying in her early 20s from disease. Uh, anyways, yeah. Uh, don't go to Disney for your history. They are not always are, uh, portraying it accurately. In this context, indentured servants... Yeah, in, indentured services. Let's, let's, let me go back so we make sure I... In kind of cut in the middle. Cash crops on which the colony relied, indentured servants were imported. In this context, indentured servants were people who sold themselves into a form of servitude for a period in order to pay for their voyage to the new world. Indentured servants were soon replaced with slaves from Africa since there was no obligation to free them and they were easier to obtain. Indian raids against the colony and rebellions against neglectful rule made it very difficult to make a profit and the colony was turned over to the English crown. There were many reasons for colonial expansion. There was a strong desire to proselytize and convert the natives of the New World, which many believed would civilize them. Some undertook extremely expensive voyages of discovery, but the most common reason was money. Spain and Portugal had amassed huge wealth trading with their colonies in China, and England didn't need much convincing. Cash crops such as tobacco and sugar were extremely profitable, and even more money could be made on the return voyages via the sale of slaves to the New World. So, um... You know, when they come over to the Americas, they're hoping to find just this abundance of easily accessible gold and all that. They don't find it. It was the Native Americans that introduced them to tobacco, which ends up being the most profitable of all the uh, American crops. Um, and uh, tobacco, you know, when it goes back to Europe, Europe gets addicted immediately, you know, to, to it and becomes a highly profitable thing. And then uh, sugar, right? So sugar comes from um, across the Atlantic and into some of those areas uh it's harder much harder to grow sugar though up in like north america where that really became the big crop would be uh down in the the more tropical region so like in brazil and the caribbean and that's uh specifically tobacco and and sugar mostly you know with sugar um use the highest percentage of slaves and where most of them went most slaves that came across uh that were taken across um, the atlantic uh, the highest percentage actually went to um, the caribbean where you know, unfortunately, the locals there um, had been basically completely wiped out from from disease. So there was no labor force. So most of them went there. The second highest percentage, I believe, of slaves went to Brazil, which were also working on um, uh, were also working in, uh, in sugar. And uh, actually, only a very small percent actually went up to the British colonies. Um what maybe around five percent of the total slaves which is still a lot because you're talking about a process that went on for a couple centuries um but yeah you can see what they were working for and this economically just um boomed the british economy to becoming a world power the atlantic triangle is this time another reason was security the money from trade as well as large overseas populations loyal to the crown provided extra manpower and money for wars to support the slave trade england established forts along the coast of africa from which they operated trading goods for gold ivory and people slaves from africa were also much easier to obtain than the indentured servants which came from england ireland or scotland 
This was because of the numerous major upheavals across the British Isles, such as the English Civil War, which saw the British Isles briefly become a republic under Oliver Cromwell. The Irish capitalised on a weakened English state and broke away from English rule. Cromwell brutally and swiftly put down these rebellions and seized huge chunks of land and gave it to his veterans. During the Civil War, the colonies generally sided with the monarchy, leading the English Commonwealth to blockade some of them. Cromwell briefly went to war with Spain, who ceded Jamaica, which would form the backbone of England's sugar and slave trades. So long story short, Cromwell died and the monarchy was restored under Charles II, who in terms of empire managed to gain New Amsterdam from the Dutch, which was swiftly renamed to New York. New York yeah. The monarchy would soon find itself in trouble again when Charles' son, James II, converted to Catholicism. You know, you see the Dutch get a, a pretty early foothold in the Americas as well, as, um, but it didn't last long. They, they really weren't able to compete, um, especially by... Uh, later in this time, the 1600s was kind of the Dutch age. I mean, they had overtaken the Portuguese for the spice trade over in East Asia, um, Southeast Asia, which is far more profitable than anything coming out of the Americas. So they, they created a monopoly on that. But then as the 1600s started to wane on, you got into the 1700s, you saw Dutch power decline um, and coincide with the rise, of, the rise of the British power. So one, one thing I've kind of, you, you can kind of look at the century wise for these exp exploration colonization nations is it's all started by Portugal, right? Who really um, make the first headways with Henry the Navigator, Vasco da Gama, first European to sail to Asia. And then the Spanish, you know, come with that. So the 1500s really belonged to like the Portuguese and the Spanish. And then the 1600s, uh, you know, so much of the global trade belonged to the Dutch. That was like their century kind of, you know. And then the 1700s uh, really belong is really going to belong to Britain and France. The Protestant England was none too pleased about this, and so some lords asked the Dutch William of Orange to become King of England, which he did in 1688. William's ascendancy to the throne caused a major French-supported uprising in Ireland, which was eventually quashed. Scotland also tried its hand at colonisation during the period by founding Nova Scotia in modern-day Canada, which was quickly lost to the French. The most notorious attempt at Scottish Empire building was the founding of the colony at Caledonia in what is now Panama in 1698, which was claimed by Spain. The colony failed due to disease and a Spanish blockade, and the English refused to help because they didn't want to provoke war. What makes Caledonia so notable was the cost of its failure, since the venture had cost Scotland almost a fifth of its national wealth and bankrupted the kingdom. Jeez. Thus, the Scottish and English empires at the turn of the 18th century looked like this. In return for England financing Scotland's debts, both kingdoms were unified by the 1707 Act of Union which gave birth to Great Britain. Great Britain immediately found itself caught up in numerous European wars. From the War of the Spanish Succession, Britain gained Gibraltar in southern Spain and large swathes of French territory in Canada. Next came the War of the Austrian Succession, which wasn't very important to empire, except that it paved the way for a much Unless more Austria. war, the Seven Years' War. Very important. Seven Years' War was a... Um, Seven Years War, I'll let, I'll let them explain just to preface it. If you don't know much about it, definitely pay attention. It's probably the most important war that doesn't get as much, nearly as much notoriety for its level of importance. I mean, seriously, it's got to be one of the, the most important wars before the World Wars, like as far, especially in the modern era. Um, and gets, gets, definitely gets glossed over, especially in America, because to Americans... <laughs> A lot uh, American history began with the American Revolution, but they're they're directly tied to. Uh, maybe they'll they'll talk about it here how the um, Seven Years War uh, is going to tie to the American Revolution, which is going to start you know about twenty years after the end of the um, of the Seven Years War. But it has a, a huge global effect. A lot of people even think that maybe uh, maybe the Seven Years War should be considered the first World War. Um, Depending on what kind of they talk about with it, you might be able to understand that case. Global conflict which saw British victory and saw the transfer of a great deal of North American territory to Britain from France and Spain. It should be noted here that for many of these countries, the wars were nothing more than excuses to seize each other's territories. The war also spread to India, where the British and French were trying to squeeze each other out. And this is, so they're fighting each other. British and French are fighting for kind of colonial domination everywhere around the world and in, in, in many continents and also of course back home and the, the the crown prize of all of it the most important and profitable colony of all was not in the americas it was india it was india this was this was the big prize you know to get this because the wealth coming out of there is just incredible um but yeah, it's and it's also this 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 war was almost ends and and fight like a winner take all thing. You're gonna get all the colonies, um, French or British, from the other side if you get this, and that's just 
uh, incredibly important for world history because it's changing hands and going to establish the dominant colonial relationship for the next, uh, you know, over 200 years. The reason for this was that trade with India was incredibly lucrative. It focused mainly on textiles, spices, and the most important consumer good of all time, tea. So by the beginning of the seven years, Love their the tea. East India Company had already established factories along the coastline of India, much of which was controlled by either the Mughal or Maratha empires. The company was largely independent and even had its own military. The company was also deeply involved in Indian politics and were very good at playing Indian lords called Nawabs off of each other for British yeah. benefit. Yeah, they. I mean, this is when England is really becoming the de facto puppet leaders of India, and since the the empire or the you know the empire is so powerful and the and, and the um, East India Company is so powerful they were totally able to find leaders loyal to them and kind of work you know and and, and work for for british intentions so they're definitely they're like puppeteers pulling the strings of india here for a long time robert clive also known as clive of india led the east india company forces there the british won a decisive victory against the indians at the battle of plasley mostly due to some double dealing after defeating the French, the Dutch, and later the Mughals, British territory in India looked like this. Bengal was particularly important since it had a taxable population twice the size of Britain. After the wars, the company began to levy heavy taxes against the locals, and Bengal quickly became an extremely important revenue stream for Britain. Robert Clive was for a short period the governor of Bengal, and one of his policies was to force local farmers to grow opium for export to China instead of food, which meant that whenever crops failed, large numbers of Bengali people starved. Britain's colony was a... Drug trade. Interesting thing about why are they selling to China? Um, remember, China was not interested in foreign goods. They make everything that they need themselves. They do not require imports. They don't really want imports. Plus, everything that's made in, in East Asia at this time is better than anything the Europeans make. Uh, the only thing the British River is successful in, in selling was, you know, and a lot of it kind of on the down low was opium, a.k.a. drugs. And it became... It, 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 created a huge epidemic of um, opium addiction in China that reached all the way up to the highest elites in the in the, the court palaces of the empire. And later on, you're going to get the opium wars, as they're called. Um, they'll probably maybe talk about this a little bit later. But anyways, that's what the story kind of with selling this drugs. And you're talking about why they're selling that stuff and not other stuff to China. China doesn't want or need any foreign goods. Not any, at least anything coming out of Europe successes in India were contrasted by its failings in North America. The number of soldiers, tax disputes, and lack of representation in the British Parliament led the 13 colonies to declare their independence. The Americans America. were led by General George Washington, who would later become the first president of the United States of America. Britain at first was able to win some major victories, but after years of sure. attrition, alongside the French and Spanish aiding the Americans, the British accepted American independence and lost all of this territory. Um... This might be not a lot of people, not a lot of things, or not a lot of that that people know too. Um, the Americans won very, very few battles in um, the American Revolution. Very few. Um, the longer the war went on, too, of course, the less popular it was back in uh, at, back in uh, back in England. So public support was also lost, and again, there were bigger bigger uh, fish to fry. Uh, with some of the other colonial things and you know they they really kind of give up america never really sees the full might of the british military um you know in 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 america and trying to keep keep uh this sort of rebellion as they as you know as they were they saw it um down because they are spread very thin in a lot of you know places like that so interesting it's always important to see the american um revolution from the perspective of the other side which isn't nearly as much of a story as it is, of course, in America. The birth of the British Empire was a slow and drawn-out process. The reasons for colonial expansion were diverse, ranging from religious calling to the desire for wealth. Colonial failure led to the creation of Great Britain, but colonial success meant that warfare now had a global scope, and it became increasingly difficult for the rest of the world to stay uninvolved from European politics. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching. This was great. I liked this a lot. Um, it was informative. Lots of good points. Always love little animations and stuff like that. Well spoken, good narrator. I really like this. I thought this was just a good little just kind of review. I think it could work for a lot of different ages, um, both young and old. I mean, I think you can you can put this in in a, in a junior high class, and you could, um, yeah, throw it up to as highest levels of learning possible. So I really liked it. Good style, um, great points. Uh, I really liked it. I think this is really good. So thanks to the. Um, patrons who selected this video in this week's poll. 
Um, if you guys like this, let me know if you kind of like this and would like to see uh, the second version or the second part, which I think it's just called The Late British Empire. I think I saw that on the list. So if you'd like to see that, um, let me know down in the comments um, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll get to it. Okay, um, if you would, again, like to be part of our uh, patron group, um, the groups or the link to the Patreon will be down below um, in the description. You can join that. And right now, any donation level um, will get you uh, membership there. And that's great. Okay, some other ways you can interact with the channel. One way is by joining our Discord. Um, we have a Discord server of history fans and have a lot of fun over there. And there will be a link down below to join that. Um, that's another way you can uh, definitely interact with the channel, interact a little bit more with me, um, get more updates and stuff like that, and just be a part of a, a great history community. So we'd love to see that down. Um, you can look down in the links too for other ways that you can support this channel, uh, both monetarily and non-monetarily. But the most important thing is um, that you're here. I'm glad you're here. Um, that's the most important thing. Hopefully enjoying uh, learning more about history because I know I sure am. Okay, with that, um, we'll go ahead and end it for today, and we'll uh, see you next time. Bye.